What does it all mean? This is where the archaeology has been found. Oh, hi, how are you? Look at that. I, I need a, a planter. A shrine to a belly button. This is a rock of salt? Look at that. No one gets into this, but no one. Whoa, don't take me too far. Now that's naked archaeology. Behind me is the Pantheon. It's a shrine to the gods of Rome. It was built in 118 by the Emperor Hadrian as a symbol of Roman power. And that power was challenged, not by another empire, but by an angry Judean and his band of guerrillas. His followers called them Bar Kokhba, the son of the star, Messiah. Who was this would-be Messiah that almost brought the power of Rome to its knees? 100 years after the crucifixion of Jesus came another Messiah. His name was Shimon Bar Kosiba. Unlike Jesus, he was a military genius and led the Jewish people in a revolt against Rome's military might. His exploits as a military leader were hailed by rabbis as almost supernatural. The greatest sage of those times, Rabbi Akiva, anointed him Messiah and renamed him Bar Kokhba, the son of the star. The son of the star. Now, why the star? Because it says in the books of Moses that a star will kind of come out of Jacob. And that's taken as the only reference to Messiah. So anybody who had messianic pretensions, anybody who said, I am Messiah, he had to be connected to a star. Therefore, the star of Bethlehem leads the three wise men to Jesus. He had to be connected to a star. In 132 CE, the Jewish people were looking for their star. They had been suffering for decades under Roman persecution. Their holy temple was in ruins, and it was about to be replaced by a pagan temple built by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. In those dark times, Bar Kokhba shone with messianic light. I spoke with the archaeologist Dan Bahat. One should remember that Bar Kokhba is not a phenomenon of one person who suddenly decides to fight the Romans and here starts a revolt. Uh, the many messiahs which showed up, you know, that Jesus Christ is very famous. But there were mess people who pretended to be messiahs. I don't, don't misunderstand me. I don't say Jesus pretended to be the messiah, but there were other people who were. Bar Kokhba is the same story. The atmosphere was for the revolt. Because remember that actually, according to what we know, there were two reasons for the revolt. One of them was the prohibition on circumcision. Here. Did he say circumcision? A prohibition Expertise. on circumcision started a war? Hadrian, he did not understand the difference between circumcision and castration. And he saw in the circumcision, he saw offense to the barbaric, barbaric exactly. And that's number one. And number two, the desire. It was think. a battle uh, that was triggered by a foreskin. <laughs> I won't say that. I won't say that. You know, the but amazing... you are saying that. Yes, but uh, still. You know, this is what I love about history. Yeah. Just this immediate connection, private, I would say, yes. with a historical figure. But Bahat wanted me to also consider the second inciting event. Emperor Hadrian was building on top of the ruined Jewish temple. The Jews believed that Hadrian was desecrating their holiest site and destroying Jerusalem. When a, Ro a Roman emperor founded a city, you know, many cities which were founded by the Romans actually existed before, but they were remade by the Romans. The, the emperor who does it will plow a pharaoh around the city. So the Jews, frightened by the fact that suddenly Jerusalem is going to change. You know, and you know, I don't have to tell you what Jerusalem symbolizes for Judaism. Just realize that in a sense, the Bar Kokhba revolt was triggered by two incisions. One was the prohibition about circumcision. The other is a furrow around Jerusalem that symbolized to the Jews that the Romans are really re-establishing it. Two so incisions, yes. Yes, that's a nice way to put it. But remember, never such a thing is the reason. This is the trigger. A trigger that released Bar Kokhba's power. But in order to stand out among a crowd of Messiah wannabes, he had to meet a few expectations of biblical proportions. 
wanted, Messiah. To apply, you must A, be chosen, anointed. B, be a spiritual warrior. C, rebuild the Holy Temple. D, bring world peace. That's a lot for one man to do. Enter Bar Kokhba. History tells us that he scored two out of four on the Messianic checklist. He was freshly anointed by a rabbi, and he was a charismatic leader who inspired tens of thousands of followers. But did he rebuild the Jewish temple? Did he bring world peace? I need to find out if Bar Kokhba lived up to the full job description of Messiah. He believes he was Messiah. Then part of his job description would have been to rebuild the temple. That's his job as Messiah. Actually, by your question, we can ask, was Bar Kokhba at all in Jerusalem? Remember that in Jerusalem, there was a Roman legion. There was always a garrison, Roman garrison in Jerusalem. I don't believe he was in Jerusalem because I think he, he knew that it is a trap. Professor Bahat suggests Bar Kokhba would have had good reasons to avoid Jerusalem. The Romans had hundreds of thousands of soldiers and the deadly 10th legion was stationed right there. What is this lamppost? have to do with the 10th Legion. Today in the Old City, we can still find a lamppost where cavalry of the 10th Legion park their horses. How's your Latin? <laughs> Not so good, My, yeah. mine is crappy. Mm. But some of the things, Maximo, Le, Ga, and the Axe. This is the Legion, the 10th Legion, the most dreaded Legion, the toughest of them all. The, they were tough. Look at that, that's much better, eh? Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. Basically, they're saying, we were here, 10th Legion. You know, like soldiers sitting around eating sandwiches, mm -hmm. right? Looking at girls, you know, talking about back home, calling on the cell phone. Let's see. They didn't have the cell phone. Well, they did have the cell phone. You know how we know? How? Because they found no wires for land telephones. Uh -huh. So they must have had cell phone. <laughs> Good thing I have mine. The people's archaeologist. Turns out, I'm late for my next meeting with historian Hannah Cotton. Okay, cut. Okay. She has archaeological proof that Bar Kokhba's army wasn't avoiding the Roman legions, but was actually crippling them. He's a total man. He's a total man. 100 years after Jesus, history tells us of a military messiah. Bar Kokhba won so many battles that Rome was scrambling to reinforce its army. I spoke with historian Hannah Cotton, who says there's archaeological proof of Bar Kokhba and his victories. The thing that struck me most was the dimensions of the revolt. This was a major revolt that was a real disaster for the Roman army that required them to take uh, emergency measures such as moving generals around, recruiting armies and bringing them here. Indeed, they lost so much, many auxiliaries that they had to have recruitments all over the empire. The Roman legions were being decimated by Bar Kokhba's rebellion. Things were going so badly that Hadrian had to drag his greatest generals from Britain and Syria to help the Roman troops in Judea. But how do we know that Bar Kokhba's leadership was having a messianic effect? Hannah Cotton tells me of a very recent find, a horde of brass Roman military diplomas dating from 160 CE. After a soldier served for 25 years, he became a Roman citizen and was given a diploma just like this. There were 150,000 soldiers in the auxiliary forces, and each one of them, after 25 years, got this. In uh, other diploma. Words, and the bottom line, what do we learn from this? that if there are as many diplomas in the year 160, it means that there was a huge recruitment 25 years before. This is exactly 135, the end of the Bar Kokhba revolt. If Rome was recruiting so many soldiers, it was because they were losing that many, which means that Bar Kokhba and his fighters were winning, right to the bitter end. What was his strategy? I'll give you a hint. Rabbits. I don't mean having babies, but that probably happened too. Actually, it has to do with the gorillas, and I don't mean the zoo animals. I mean human fighters who use a particular kind of warfare, surprise attacks. And it was this simple tactic that totally crippled the huge Roman military machine. 
guide, Tirza Cohen, leads me through one of Bar Kokhba's rebel hideouts. Honey, I'm home. We're beneath what was once an ancient village in the Judean hills. Here, Bar Kokhba's rebels had dug out a rabbit warren of caves and tunnels 2,000 years ago. They did this to fight their guerrilla warfare against the unsuspecting Romans above. With these tunnels, Bar Kokhba's band of guerrillas wiped out an entire legion. The 20th Legion soldiers were clueless as to where the rebels were hiding and from where they would strike next. It goes through this little passageway. If you're looking for a revolutionary, you wouldn't find anything. Right, right behind this thin wall, there's an entire living quarter in there. There's an apartment. Up above, the Romans are looking for you, and they could look and look and look and never imagine that underneath their feet, there's an entire network. That's what you have here is the underground water supply. There's a huge cistern in here. You can be totally underground, and you can have water. The cistern fills up with water. So does this internal cave well. That means that you could just take your bucket, fill it up. But if there isn't a lot of water, hasn't been a lot of rain, the water is low. Look, they chiseled a ladder into the side, see, into the side of the well. So let me, I'll go down there. They were very agile in those days. They were much smaller than you are. Yeah, they were. To there, you bring up the water. It's lower, you climb in further. The whole time, you know, Moishe's your uncle. You can't, uh, they can't find you. Bar Kokhba was leader of a massive underground army that controlled a lot of territory. According to ancient historian Cassius Dio, over 900 settlements of the Jewish rebels were eventually destroyed by Rome. At each settlement, there were networks of these cave tunnels. Today, archaeologists have only uncovered about 20% of them. This is incredible. Wow, this is a living quarter. The people who lived in here were hiding from the Roman authorities so that they could preserve their faith. While the Romans were trying to stamp out the biblical faith, people were paying a heavy price living in these caves, literally in these kind of Lord of the Rings caves. They were eating in here, were sleeping in here. They were lighting their candles over here. They were reading, they were praying, they were chatting, they, they, were, they were making love, they were having children in these underground caves so that they could survive, but not just physically, spiritually. They weren't ready to pay the price of giving up their faith. Without doubt, Bar Kokhba was a spiritual warrior. From his headquarters at Beitar, Bar Kokhba was able to command his rebel fighters hiding in thousands of networks like these. How do we know this? Well, we have the Messiah's word on it. Fifty years ago, archaeologists found 2,000-year-old papyri letters in a cave in the Judean desert. In the letters, they found Bar Kokhba's very own signature. Until these letters were found, the only documents that named Bar Kokhba as the leader of the revolt were rabbinic sources. So what great things did the Messiah write? Unfortunately, these documents are short, angry dispatches to his fighters. And in some letters, he seems to be obsessed with the Hebrew holiday Sukkot, or Tabernacles, a feast which commemorates the 40 years that the Jews wandered in the desert. Why is this would-be Messiah so concerned with this particular holiday? Well, it is a puzzle. These were a field commander corresponding with his subordinates. Yeah, if and a commander is talking to you subordinates... You read too much into that. And also, it's always such tiny, trivial details as a cow being stolen or a donkey to be moved or people to be punished. But he does ask for the Sukkot stuff. That tells us something. Yes, that, that tells us indeed that they kept the Jewish holidays. But what you lack here is the personal dimension. And if you're asking for a hint, I don't think you get it in the documents. I think they're very disappointing. Sure, his letters don't claim he was the Messiah. But what they tell us about Bar Kokhba's commitment to the holiday of Sukkot is quite interesting when taken together with another archaeological find. Bar Kokhba's rebels minted their own money, and archaeologists have found their coins everywhere in Judea. 
Some show myrtle, willow, and palm fronds bound together beside an etrog or large citron. These were the specific plants God commanded the Jews to use in the celebration of Sukkot. Why was this holiday so important to Bar Kokhba and his followers? In the Gospels, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem and is greeted by people waving palm fronds. Did Bar Kokhba choose the palm because of its messianic significance? Turning the coin over, we see the temple, above which shines a star. And the star shall come out of Jacob, says the Torah. Kochba is the Aramaic word for star. Some say these coins prove Bar Kochba rebuilt the temple. So personally, I think he was in Jerusalem. I think he conquered the place. But now they say, wait a minute. How come we never found those coins in Jerusalem? He must have not conquered Jerusalem. How do they know? They don't know. Me, my money's on. Bar Kochba was in Jerusalem, and by the time this show airs, they'll find some coins in Jerusalem. I drove back to Dan Bahat. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Now, one of the things that I heard is that Bar Kochba did attempt to build a third temple depicted in this coin. Look, we have to be very careful with messianic temples. We, I think till today that the coins of Bar Kochva are a kind of a vision rather than, uh, rather than reality. Meaning future dreams? Future dreams, yes, yes, yes. So he's making a claim? He's making a claim to the possibility, yes. To be a messiah? Yes. On Bar Kochva's coins, Dan Bahat sees only messianic dreams. But I met with Rabbi Rosenberg, who explained to me that historically, leaders didn't waste time minting possibilities. Could this be a fantasy? Um, I mean, could it be like an election promise, Bar Kochva's minting coins of what he plans to build? No. It, uh, according to most scholars, coins were only minted after actual accomplishments. For example, we know that there was a coin that was minted in the era of Hadrian, which shows a man behind an ox. This is called the coin of the plowing of Jerusalem. Emperor Hadrian minted a coin showing an actual event, his plowing of Jerusalem. Rabbi Rosenberg claims that the temple images on Bar Kochva's coins are no fantasy, but a fulfillment of the prophecy. And that's the third requirement on Bar Kochva's messianic checklist. And guess what? Rabbi Rosenberg says that the foundations laid for Bar Kokhba's temple are still visible today and no one even notices. Rabbi Rosenberg believes that Bar Kokhba did build the temple that the Messiah is supposed to build according to the specifications outlined by the prophet Ezekiel three out of four on the Messianic checklist. There is some rather complicated mathematical measurements which do show that the area which we call the Temple Mount today actually matches the exact measurements of what the third temple should look like as described in the book of Ezekiel. And that is why some modern scholars postulate that Bar Kokhba actually completed the building of this third temple. Oh, so he's saying the measurements of what's there today don't correspond to what we know about the second temple. That's correct. They do correspond to the messianic dimensions of the temple. That's correct. The second temple, which was destroyed by Rome in 70 CE, had a courtyard that measured 500 feet by 500 feet. The Temple Mount Courtyard today measures 550 feet by 540 feet. Ezekiel's specifications for the Messianic Temple was 550 by 540. Which could only lead us to the remnants of the Bar Kokhba Temple. I mean, that's pretty big stuff. I mean, that would explain why somebody of Akiva's stature would say, He's got to be the Messiah. Absolutely. 
It was a sad, sad day for Rabbi Akiva when he realized that the camel he was backing had a heart defect. He loved himself too much. Wow. You should have warned me about that. It's different than a horse. A horse doesn't do that. Whoa, whoa. The thoroughbred warrior Bar Kochva, caught up in his battle successes, became arrogant. Bar Kochva never did accomplish the fourth messianic task of bringing world peace. He refused spiritual guidance from the rabbis, and as punishment, they said, God withdrew his support. And that's when they basically said he lost it. He went over to the dark side. So instead of Bar Kochva, the son of the star, they made a play on his name, which is Bar Chosiba, and they called him the son of the liar, the son of the lie. So he had his moment, and it was a glorious moment, actually. It was a glorious moment. But then he went from being the son of the star to the son of the lie. Sad. Bar Kochva died fighting the Romans at his headquarters in Beitar in 135 CE, and thousands of his followers were killed or captured and made slaves. His revolt had a final death toll of almost 600,000 Jewish fighters and untold numbers of civilians. Hadrian banished Jews from Jerusalem, allowing them to enter the city only once a year to mourn. But Bar Kochva did leave a fighting legacy. We were told here on the street, one guy we stopped said he was a loser. A person who loses a battle is a loser. But sometimes you have to judge 100 years, 50 years, or 1,000 years afterwards exactly what he achieved. And losers sometimes can be winners. So you think Bar Kochva, at the end of the day, was definitely a winner. He's a tall, tall man from a tall, tall man.